Okay, so that's a little trickier question. It's, uh, it's very clear in our calculations and our understanding of the symmetries of physics that when, ma when dark matter and anti-dark matter come in contact with each other, they also annihilate. What is less clear is what happens when you bring together a piece of matter of one type and a, and a antimatter of another type and you, and you bring them together. If, depending upon what the interactions are between them, there would be a partial annihilation depending upon what the channels are. So if you bring uh, a positron in contact with a neutron, then there'll be an interaction in which, which eventually you get a, a, a electron neutrinos or something out of, the, out of the situation. And it's not very much, but if you have an anti-pion come in contact with a proton, then you get some partial interactions that dissipate that, a lot of that energy, the equivalent energy. But it depends on what the lowest state are and what else is going on. So it's very complicated. It depends on the channels of the interaction. What we think is there are no uh, strong interactions between the dark matter and ordinary matter. So the, the, if you bring them into contact, the annihilation rate would be very slow compared to what it would be. And we think that the interactions that the dark matter uh, is primarily involved is, is gravity, because that's where its biggest noticeable effect is, and probably the weak interactions. So the weak interactions are more than 100, you know, they're, they're so 100 million times weaker than the strong interactions that usually govern annihilation. So the, there would be annihilation, but it would be at a much slower rate. And so you wouldn't get angels and demons or whatever. The, I, I haven't seen the movie. I've forgotten the title for it. You wouldn't get this immediate annihilation. And, uh, and in fact, if you did the calculation on how long it would take Fermilab to collect enough antimatter to blow up Rome, it, it was like 50 million years. So it, it's, antimatter is very, very, very reactive with, with matter and very efficient. But making it and collecting it is a, is a much more difficult problem than it would look like. Okay. If you were in a gravity-free environment, what would happen to time? Okay. So this is an interesting question. Um, the answer is we think in a gravity-free environment, time flows along at its maximum rate. That is, that, that normally you think about space and time as being part of this nice system in Euclidean space and time, or, or Newtonian kind of space and time. The space directions are absolute and the time direction is absolute and time flows along continuously and smoothly in that direction. If you have a gravity-free environment, I interpret that to mean you're in a situation where the curvature of space is essentially very small, so that time goes normal to that, doesn't get distorted around like you would around a black hole or even a heavy object. And you would see that time was flowing along at its most rapid rate right, that, that it can. And that's effectively, in the right units, the speed of light that you're moving along the time axis at the speed of light in that kind of situation. Now, it's very difficult to be in a gravity-free environment because, as you know, gravity is a long-range force, right? So it's 1 over r squared. So even in, you know, and as you approach infinity, there's always gravity. So we have a universe that's full of material, energy and material. And so its gravity reaches around over very great distances. And so when to define a gravity-free environment, you want the sum of all the gravity from all these objects to average out to roughly zero, right, the, the gravitational field. And usually you do it in terms of gravitational potential rather than, than over there. And so in that case, you'd like the gravitational potential to be just the critical density to, to make the gravitational potential energy and the total uh, energy content of the universe and kinetic and mass energy to be zero. Right? That's, that's what you think of it. So the gravity-free environment is a, is is, a, is something you have to define. You either have to define that you have this sort of pseudo-Euclidean space or that you have a universe that's very balanced. It turns out we live very much in an environment like that. Our universe is very close to flat, which means it's very close to zero net energy. Right? So when measuring the cosmic microwave background, do you have to subtract out radiation from other sources? Okay, that's the first question. And the answer is yes, but we've been very fortunate that the universe uh, has a window in between the low frequency emission from radio emission from galaxies and, and uh, synchrotron sources, you know, electrons spiraling in magnetic fields, and the high uh, frequency signal that comes from dust. Dust particles are so small that they, they, they try and radiate at things at wavelengths that are much longer than they are and they're not very effective. 
they're most effective at ra radiating at wavelengths near their size or smaller because then they, they can act like an effective antenna. When it goes to very long wavelengths, if you have a wavelength that long and you're trying to match it, match it to a, something smaller than a cross section of a hair, that they don't match very well. So, so there's a window in which uh, there's not a lot of radiation. And fortunately, that's near the peak of the cosmic microwave background radiation at the present time. So it turns out that except when you have a very high angular resolution, that is a very big antenna that lets you have a very small, you don't see that many sources that are so bright that you have to subtract them out. And so when we did the COBE map, we only had a few things, like the planets and a couple of radio sources we had to just cut out of the map. And the planets move around, so you can actually replace that data. It's the couple sources. On W map, which has roughly a million pixels, um, about 1,000 pixels had to be stamped out, right? Either subtract, you know, model subtracted, or just stamp out those pixels and look at the rest of the sky. Uh, on Planck, it should be quite a lot more. It will be 10, more, over 10 million pixels. There's higher angular resolution on the sky. And there we expect tens of thousands of pixels to have sources in them that will be large enough that you would have to subtract them or you have to, to just cookie cutter them out. But we cookie cutter out, right, roughly 25% of the sky because of the plane of the galaxy. We have a spiral We live in a spiral galaxy and we live in the plane of the galaxy. So when you try and look in the plane of the galaxy, you pretty much can't see. So we already cookie cutter, you know, it looks like this, you know, this characteristic model of the galaxy is stomped out of the map, then we just don't use that data. Even though you'll see some beautiful artistic renditions where we put our best model and subtract it away, we're now getting down to such, you know, at the beginning that was sufficient, but now we're trying to go to such precision that we don't trust that our model of the galaxy is sufficiently good. So, so the last one from Govin is, why is it there is less antimatter than matter? The other is, how can we analyze dark matter? How did he detect it and how did he know it exists? That's from Bryant and Rishab. And then if mass is conserved, how can matter be annihilated by antimatter? Where does that mass go? John. So let me do the two antimatter one and then I'll get to the dark matter one. Okay. Okay. So mass is conserved is uh, an early concept which is extremely handy in chemistry. Right? And what we actually believe and know to be true is that energy is what's conserved. As long as the laws of physics are time invariant, then the complementary to that is that energy is conserved. In the case of chemical reaction, the energy involved is so small compared to the rest energy of the particles, effectively the mass looks conserved. If you do nuclear reactions, then the energy involved is roughly a thousandth of the energy in a proton or a neutron. And so you can actually see the mass changes. And in fact, one of the ways they measure how much energy is taken up, either absorbed or released in a, in a nuclear reaction is to measure the masses of the particles before the reaction and the masses of the particle after the reaction in mass spectrographs. And the difference is, is, the, is the energy difference and so forth. And that's how the entire table of isotopes and so forth is made up. And so when it comes to annihilation, the energy scales involved are equal to the energy scales of the masses. So that it's the total energy that matters. And you use Einstein's you know, equation that equals mc squared to tell you what the conversion, when you convert matter or mass into energy, what the conversion factor is. And you're doing it all along, and if you did it, if you did it for chemical reactions, it's an electron volt compared to a thousand, well, to a thousand GeV, so, so to a GeV, which is ten to the ninth electron volts. So you're, you're, it's a very tiny effect in terms of how the masses change when you do chemical reactions, and so it's uh, the mass is conserved is a good rule for chemistry and for kinetic experiments, right? For us driving around and hitting walls and things like that, mass ends up conserved. It's, it's only when you get to where you're doing the very high energies or you're doing conversion of matter to energy on a major scale that you have to realize that, that way. So a lot of the physics is about how energy exists in many forms and how it gets changed from one form to another is what the physics is. So first understanding that heat is a kind of energy, that matter is a kind of energy, mass is a kind of energy and so forth. That's the uh, the, the question. So now when matter and antimatter are annihilated, the mass, you know, if you put a proton and a proton together, the mass may be, of the protons may be annihilated 
and come out in lower mass particles, pions, electrons, and neutrinos, much lower mass particles on the sum, but they have a tremendous amount of kinetic energy that come out with them. So the sum of all the energies, the rest mass energies and the kinetic energies, will come up equal to the sum of the two rest masses, the, particle, the proton and the proton, so it's twice the rest mass of the proton. And so that mass goes into energy. That's why people would love to have antimatter engines because it's about the most efficient conversion of, of energy storage you can think about. But it has some downsides to it. Okay. So one of the questions, then the related question is, why is it there is uh, less antimatter than matter? And uh, that, of course, is, is now well established. I did a series of experiments, and so did many other people. And, uh, and I, I got out of the business once we, we were I was convinced that there was no significant antimatter in our galaxy. And the, what we did was, you can just look around, people have been to the moon, things have landed on planets. It's obvious that there's not an annihilation going on when they, they land there because you get radio signals back afterwards. And, uh, but, so we started looking for other samples and we looked in the cosmic rays. There are energetic particles that come from the galaxy and from outside the galaxy. They come to the Earth and you can test and see if they're matter or antimatter just by looking at their charge, see which way they bend in the magnetic field. And you can tell whether they're bending left or right if you have a time of flight and you follow their trajectory. And uh, it became clear to me that there was no serious antimatter in our, uh, our galaxy and that it must come from further away. And then you have to use the fact that you can look for annihilation. There are clusters of galaxies. And if some were matter and some were antimatter, even though a star and antistar might not hit each other, there's some gas between them and those gases would mix and there would be annihilation radiation. You'd see that. You'd see the gamma rays coming from the <coughs> annihilation of the products. And you don't see very much evidence of that. You do see some annihilation gamma ray and X-ray lines from anti-electrons annihilating with electrons. And that's because some interactions are so high energy that as part of the interaction, they can make matter and antimatter particles. And those particles then, the antimatter particles end up annihilating on the matter particles around. So you can see a 511 keV, either X-ray or gamma ray line, depending on your, your, your viewpoint, from, <coughs> from near the galactic center and from other galaxies. And that is, comes from relativistic jets of particles coming out of, of objects and then producing secondaries and so forth, as far as we can tell. And people are always speculating that way because it could be dark matter annihilation and part of the decay products and the, and the annihilation will be some electron positron pairs that will that'll annihilate. And so people are wondering about that. So the, then the question is, why is there? And no, uh, no one has, has a, a clear, well-supported situation, although what we have was Andrei Sakharov, when he was under house arrest in his later years, he, he was the father of Soviet hydrogen bomb, but then he became uh, sort of a, what they call a peacenik, but he was a human rights person, and uh, was speaking out about some of the things the Soviets were doing. But he was such a brilliant physicist, they didn't want to kill him or put him in prison. They put him under house arrest and limited his access to the world. So he worked on problems he could work on without much of a library and so forth. So one of the problems he worked on was uh, how is it there's more matter than antimatter in the universe? And he set down these conditions that, that, that uh, you have to have in order for this. You have to have a way for protons to decay or to be, you have to have an excess, a way to make excess of matter or of antimatter. And you have to have non-equilibrium. If you have chemical equilibrium, if the reaction will go one way, it'll go the other way. And so if you try and make an, even if you have a reaction that makes an imbalance, you can run the reaction backwards. So you have to have non-equilibrium and so forth. Turns out you have to have the violation of the symmetry of matter and antimatter. And so there is, this is called a CP violation, but you need a C violation. So C is the symmetry that turns matter into antimatter. P is left-handed to right-handed. It's reverse left and right. And so he established that. And there have been two evidence of CP violation seen, but it isn't the right ones for, for making this happen in the early universe. So we know the conditions. We know the rules of what has to happen. We just don't know what the mechanism. And so people worry about it doing it in the grand unification and also in the electroweak symmetry breaking. So the, one of the reasons people are excited about CERN is they're hoping that at CERN, in the electroweak symmetry breaking, the leptons will show this violation and there'll be an imbalance of leptons, but it turns out the imbalance of baryons is tied to the imbalance. And so you can, you can, it's the tail will wag the dog and make the universe interesting. But that's what I was saying. One of the unsolved problems in cosmology is why there's more matter than antimatter. We just, 
it's a problem we haven't solved yet. We know it's true. We put it in by hand. We make the models of the early universe. We put in there's an excess of a part in a billion matter over antimatter and, and let the annihilations and everything go forward. And then what's left? We're just the remnants, right? But we think really that part in a billion or part in 10 billion is some, some basically chemical reaction, but a nuclear or higher energy physics reaction that drove an imbalance between the matter and antimatter in the very early universe. They were perfectly equal, right? statistically equal. Right? So in, in the TED video, there's many TED videos, but I assume. It's probably from 07 and 08. Right. Uh, uh, TED video UV, I'm not sure what that is. Watched Planck had not been launched. Now that it's in orbit, are you getting ready for new information? Right. So th this is the very current uh, event. And that is on May 14th, uh, we had the launch of Planck. And it was very interesting because I got to go to French Guiana, which the only way to get there easy is to go to Paris and fly, <laughs> fly back to, to French Guiana, which is in South America. And uh, I got to see the new spaceport that's being built up there, which is very nice. It, so it has a lightweight launch, launcher. And it has the heavyweight launcher, which is the Ariane 5, which is what we launched uh, Herschel and Planck on. And then they're preparing to make a Soyuz launcher, which is a, the Soviet's workhorse. It's a middleweight launcher. And they're trying to build a site there, or they're building a site there, which they claim they'll be able to launch one a month to orbit. And that's a big issue in about the development of space. We're coming up on uh, having the, the person, if there was a launch yesterday, I didn't pay attention. There was supposed to be a shuttle launch yesterday. If that was a shuttle launch, went off according to space, that would be the 500th person to go to space and be on that, one of the people on the shuttle. That, that there's, a, there's a whole issue about who's going to space and when. And right now, there's a big effort in Asia. The question is, what will the United States and Europe, which are the leaders, what are they going to do? And the Soviets that used to, used to be the Soviets were leaders, but now they're kind of falling behind. How are they going to ally? And how, how, are, how is humankind going to keep going to space? But the Planck inertial launch was a very sophisticated launch. It launched on Ariane. There were two, two very sophisticated spacecraft. And they were launched simultaneously together. And, uh, and the launch went very smoothly. And uh, so uh, they, they separated near the top of the atmosphere. They threw off the fairing, and then they orient, and they threw off the shields, and then they threw off the Herschel, and then they threw off the next shield, and then they threw off Planck. And then Planck started this long journey out to Lagrange Point 2, which it got to on July 2nd and finished being stabilized on July 4th. So last weekend, right? not this weekend, but previous weekend is when we got there. And, uh, it's a, a very, both satellites are very unusual. They have very cool detectors. So for the first 10 days, we were doing back out. That is, we had heaters on to keep everything heated to, to uh, boil off volatile materials. So you know you absorb a certain amount of water vapor out of the air onto the surfaces. If you opened up the cool, very cool things, it would freeze water on the optics and on the equipment and, and make it not work. So we, bit, we did a bake out, right? It's the opposite of what you think we were baking, we were baking it out and uh, just letting things go on. Even a fingerprint, people are supposed to all wear gloves, but even the oil in your hand will, will out gas and it will get on the optics and so on. So we spent 10 days baking out, and then the heaters were turned off, and we radiatively cooled until we got down to a temperature which was somewhat below 80 Kelvin. At that point, as things were thermally at the right temperature and stabilizing, because we do differences of temperatures, it was beginning to take good data. We did the maneuvers to get into orbit, and then the, the engineers and the managers and the technicians all decide they want to do a complete checkout of the spacecraft. And they've been turning things on and off. So in principle, we are taking data. In practice, it's been interrupted a little bit. But we were taking a little bit of data just before we got to orbit. The spacecraft was spinning, to do, doing the spinning for its scan, actually from the day it left Earth orbit. Right? It's, we spun it up before we, we ejected it and so forth. Or they spun it up before it was ejected. So the spacecraft is now out at Lagrange Point 2, which is an interesting place. There are five Lagrange points. It's a place where if you go straight in a straight line from the sun to the earth out there is Lagrange Point 2. The combined gravity of the earth and the sun make that spot co-orbit with the earth. Right? So you keep this alignment. And, but then you'd be in a shadow. So you actually orbit around it. And it's a, it, the potential isn't nice like this. So you stay stabilized. It's that way in one direction. and the other direction, it rolls off. So you have to do station keep. So it makes this lizard you figure around the, around the shadow. And the other, the Herschel satellite makes a lizard you figure a little further out so they won't hit each other. 
And uh, so we're out there, we're in that orbit. How well it was inserted in the orbit and so forth depends on how long we can stay there because you have to make corrections periodically because you can drift off. You know, it's like a horse's saddle. You can drift, you, if you roll a marble on a horse's saddle, it'll roll back and forth like this on the right way, but the other way it'll, it'll fall off. So we have to keep it from falling off. So we were there and we we're taking data and uh, the checkout and the early operations primarily are being done from Paris and also from Trieste. It's, it's essentially we compress the data and we store it on board and compress it some more and then it's sent down in a burst each day because we don't want to be running the telemetry while we're taking the data. So we have a burst that we send to the, to the Earth periodically, even though the antennas can point back to the sun, and the antennas in the solar cell point back to the sun and the Earth, right? It's, it, uh, we, we don't do it all the time. But you get a large amount of data. Um, we're getting around 4,000 bytes a second worth of data and then we compress it and then it gets decompressed when we get back. And eventually, my guess is approximately a year and a half, two years, it will actually come back to, to, Ber to, to LBL for the high-level processing. But right now, we're doing the, the checkout and the calibration and everything like that.